Redmond, Oregon. And Dr. Eschebach uh, does quite a bit of instruction on the uh, EMS lecture circuit. And he's, uh, from what I understand, he's a mover and shaker up there in Oregon. A lot of people seem to know who he is. And we have always enjoyed his lectures. So that having been said, if anyone else joins in over the next little bit, we'll let them come in quietly. But Jeff and Randy, you have to kind of stay there. Dr. Eschelbach may stop at some point and ask you a question. And at the end, we'll check in with you again to make sure you're still here for credit. Thank you. Well, All thank right. you and again. Um, thank you, Jane. We're gonna talk tonight about acute um, coronary syndrome and cardiac care. And uh, this is a pretty broad and wide topic, but what we're going to learn and discuss is that acute coronary syndrome is a continuum that goes all the way from chest pain that goes away all the way to a uh, STEMI. And um, just have you think about your approach to chest pain with a, a patient. Uh, of course, we all know uh, the worst possible scenario is uh, a fatal rhythm and a code, and uh, we all learn about that. So we'll talk about that first. All right, so if you think that can't happen, believe me, I've seen it. Okay, so why do we do the things we do? Why do we go from the field and why do we fly somebody who's got a STEMI? Why do we take somebody to the cath lab? Why do we rush to take care of patients? We're gonna go over uh, acute coronary syndrome and understand um, here's our basic objectives. We're going to understand the syndrome as a syndrome, which means a group of signs and symptoms that point the way to a diagnosis. We're also going to understand that acute coronary syndrome is a continuum. The patient may change every minute and the syndrome may change every minute. And if we understand that not all chest pain is um, a, a STEMI, but may lead to a STEMI, then we've got an understanding of the syndrome. Uh, what this lecture is not, it's not <clears throat> advanced cardiac life support or what you would call PHCLS, pre-hospital cardiac life support for dummies. Uh, it's, um, we're not gonna go over protocols per se, although I do talk about our local protocols. But um, we're gonna understand a little bit about why we do the things we do and understand uh, as a medical director where I think uh, paramedics run into mistakes. So very, very briefly, old study, but still very, very relevant uh, is evidence-based medicine. And we try and practice everything by uh, evidence-based medicine. And this is a quote saying, there's an unsettling truth about the practice of medicine. Study after study shows that few physicians, and I would add paramedics, systematically apply to everyday treatment the scientific evidence that works best. What that means is, here's a study that's uh, over 20 years old. And things that were taught in 1997 are still being taught today. And change is very, very slow. And I'll talk about some specific examples about how we try and move forward, yet we fall back into old habits. So this is a real call uh, from a medical director of a clinic by me. In this particular clinic, we have uh, nurse practitioners, paramedics who work there, we have PAs who work there, and we have quite a few retired emergency uh, physicians. So Dr. Eschelbach, this is Dr. Jones at Rural Health Clinic. I'd like to talk to you about your crew who asked me why I was transporting a patient to the hospital with a normal EKG. The patient was a female 
had a history of high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, and normal vital signs. They asked me why she had to go by ambulance to the hospital. Uh, there was a fire in the neighboring town and they felt her family might be able to drive her. Well, this is, believe it or not, a common mistake in acute coronary syndrome. Uh, when we recognize that acute coronary syndrome is more than just a STEMI, it's a continuum, and we have to understand that from the beginning of chest pain to the end of chest pain, we have to take every chest pain seriously. We uh, sometimes fail when uh, we look at normal vital signs. When we look at a normal EKG, we have to scratch below the surface and understand that not all STEMIs, meaning ST elevation MIs that need to go to the cath lab now, present themselves as STEMIs. Sometimes it's something more subtle. And here is that patient uh, when they went to the cath lab. Here is number one, uh, prior to getting the stent. And then number two, after a stent was placed. And here is another section of that heart that showed complete left anterior descending, uh, descending occlusion. And, and then when we got a stent in, revitalized. Now that is a STEMI. And this is a patient who had a normal EKG, but the physician in the clinic had a high enough suspicion that something else was going on. And when the patient went to the cath lab, it really was serious as a heart attack. So let's just look at uh, healthcare in general. This is an amusing slide that I've used over a number of years. And then here's the number of encounters for each fatality and then the total lives lost per year. Uh, let's go with something like bungee jumping and mountain climbing. That's what you consider probably risky behavior. Now I've done both and I've paid the price for jumping off a cliff, uh, you know, um, wound up a trauma victim. Look at something that we consider probably pretty uh, risky, like nuclear power or scheduled airlines. Look where they are, how many people have to be seen before there's a fatality. Driving is here, and where do you think healthcare is? Right here. So what's that saying, that we're dangerous, or maybe we could be dangerous? So what this chart is just basically saying is, let's do our very best, along with the evidence-based medicine that I talked to you about, to make sure that we're further to the right of this curve over here, closer to nuclear power than we are to bungee jumping. So is EMS any good at, at acute coronary syndrome? And this was a study done in 2012 that said, yeah, we're able to read EKGs in the field and we do a pretty good job of de determining that a STEMI is a STEMI. Now, in this particular study, they had uh, predictive values of 59.5 and 97.7, respectively. What I'll tell you here in this area is we have about a 97% positive activation of what we call a HEART-1, which is a STEMI, where the paramedic can read the EKG, wake up the cardiologist day or night and say, this person needs to go to the cath lab. We're at about 96 to 97%. I think that's pretty darn good. So let's talk about cardiovascular disease. The risk of the patient with heart disease is greatest, not by identifying an acute MI. As I said, 97% of the time uh, we can do that, but rather identifying an acute coronary syndrome. These are the atypical patients uh, who are more than we may wish to believe. So let's talk about acute coronary syndrome. Like when is an MI not an MI? And here is the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome. Let's talk about grandpa, grandma, or your next door neighbor who's out shoveling some stow and he gets a little bit of chest pain he sits down and rests. He takes a nitroglycerin and his pain goes away. 
that's angina. And he may or may not have any EKG changes, and he may or may not be having a heart attack. And then we go all the way up the spectrum to unstable angina, which is angina, which comes at rest, to a non-Q wave MI, which we're not going to talk about today, but we'll talk about an EKG lecture in the future. Um, and then there's the non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. That's the lady who was in the clinic who had a normal EKG, but she had atypical symptoms and the doctor had pretty high suspicion. And then of course, way over here is the STEMI and then death. So that's the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome. Anything from the simple gentleman who sits down, takes his nitro and gets better, all the way to folks who can die. What is suspicious chest pain? Well, we really all know what it is. It's classic angina, or angina, if you want to pronounce it that way, which is dull pressure, usually substernal. And if you can see my hand, I'll move my hand here. They usually describe it with uh, a open or a flat hand as opposed to pointing. And uh, it can be radiation to the arm, neck, some shortness of breath, sweating, nausea, and vomiting. That's what they teach us in school. That's classic angina. There can also be something called an anginal equivalent where there's no pain, but you get sudden heart failure, ventricular dysrhythmias, or maybe the angina equivalent is something as simple as a toothache or a backache. And then there's atypical chest pain, which is somewhere in the precordial area, but may be interpreted as musculoskeletal pain, positional pain, pleuritic features. These are the ones that we'll talk about a little bit later that are very common in females, diabetics, and elderly patients. So this chart is the ER diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. Very, very busy. We have to get into the history. We have to do our exam and EKG. We do cardiac markers like troponin. Now, some of you in your agencies may have troponin in the field, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Most of the time, our paramedics can only go one way, meaning they only have one hospital to choose. And if they have an abnormal EKG that shows that they're having a STEMI, they wake up the cardiac cath team and they let the ER know that they've got a heart one coming in. But some places have these little troponins. Troponins are cardiac markers that is a lab, and there are some instant troponins. And let's say you're 30 miles from hospital A and 20 miles from hospital B, and hospital A has a cath unit and hospital B doesn't, you might go to hospital B if your troponin's negative and it's closer or something like that. And we take in history, the character of the pain, the clinical exam. We look at the EKG more than once, and we do our cardiac markers more than once. Unfortunately, you haven't got all that available in the field. So you do the best you can by getting a history, and you kind of base it on the patient's history, their physical exam. What does their EKG look like right now? And you kind of break people into three groups automatically. This is non-cardiac chest pain. You know, it only hurts when I laugh or it hurts when I move my arm. Is it the unstable angina that won't get better with nitroglycerin or are they having a frank uh, MI right in front of you? It's like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking. All right, so that has to do with history. If somebody is a heavy smoker and they've got a family history, you're gonna take that into account. So what is ischemia? Ischemia is when the heart becomes ischemic because there's a lack of oxygen. Uh, somehow oxygen is taken away from the heart either because there's fixed heart disease or there is a process of a STEMI forming and it no longer goes to the myocardium, but it goes elsewhere. Little or no oxygen is available for the work of contraction and this leads to cardiac ischemia. That's the ability to affect the ventricle and the ability for the ventricle to eject blood and therefore 
and MI happens. PVCs are sometimes generated during this time, and this can sometimes cause a lethal arrhythmia leading to either VTAC or uh, VFib if it's in the wrong area. Angina is that chest pain, angina pectoris is its full name, uh, and that is heart pain in the chest, and it's caused when the heart tissues don't get enough oxygen like we just talked about. Typically, meaning people who read the book, it's crushing or squeezing, and it's brought on by the onset of the three E's, like exercise, eating, or emotion. It usually resolves with rest or medication, Somebody sits down, takes their nitroglycerin, they rest, and the heart uh, pain goes away. And it may be difficult to diagnose this from an acute MI. So Anja has a typical picture. This is a picture of, by a guy named Netter who drew many, many uh, medical um, pictures. And this is the typical guy who's coming out of a restaurant He's dropping his cigarette over here. He's walking through the snow. He's just eaten. And this is the typical angina that we see where it's in the chest, going down the inside of the left arm or sometimes into the neck. But it can have another face as well. And angina can simply be what's going on underneath the surface, which is this plaque in the coronary artery a spasm can happen or there's a narrowing of the artery and you don't get enough oxygen. We talked about oxygen. And if you don't get enough oxygen in the heart, you start to have chest pain. So the classic symptoms that we just talked about, like in the netter picture is pressure, fullness, sometimes a squeezing pain in the center of the chest, radiation to the neck or inner arm, they can break out in a sweat or diaphoresis. They can sometimes get uh, nausea or shortness of breath. And then sometimes they just complain of uh, weakness. Usually the frequency of the symptoms, about 78% of the people will get this uh, breaking out in a sweat or diaphoresis. 64 will have the classic chest pain. Nausea in about half the people, shortness of breath in about half the people. And here's very interesting, no signs or symptoms in about 25%. Atypical presentations are also pretty common. These are the ones that are common in the elderly, diabetics, and females. Sometimes it's just fatigue. Uh, older folks who are weak and dizzy. I can't tell you how many times in a week I'll see a 80 year old who's weak and dizzy and we have to do a cardiac workup. Uh, fatigue, unusual shortness of breath, nausea, dizziness, sometimes it's just belching or burping or indigestion, palpitations, and pain in only the jaw, neck, back, or arm. This is where we miss a lot because people come in and they've got arm pain or back pain and we don't consider that it could be something else. So, Here's your lesson. All chest pain should be considered an acute MI until proven otherwise. What does that mean for a paramedic? That means do your screening exam, get your history, do your EKG, and then follow your protocols. We'll talk about protocols in a few minutes. So how common is ischemic heart disease? Well, there's about 12 million or 12.2 million people in the United States who have had an MI angina or both every year. Uh, about 5 million Americans visited the emergency department for chest pain in 1997. And that statistic, believe it or not, has not gone up significantly higher, but we're somewhere around 6 million in this particular uh, time frame. About 1.4 million will be hospitalized for some form of heart disease and about 1.1 million will have some form of heart disease every year. This is an older study. However, these numbers haven't changed that much. So what's the threat of acute coronary syndrome? As I said, about 5.3 million visits a year, 
about 15% of unstable angina or non-STEMI patients die or have another MI within 30 days. This is the biggest statistic that drives the way that we treat chest pain. We can rule out chest pain in the ER, meaning serial EKGs, serial troponins. Some places might send somebody automatically to a stress test, but we generally, if we have uh, no evidence of a heart attack, we'll try and get that person into a cardiologist and on a treadmill within about 24 hours. So here's a, a nice picture again by Netter that talks a little bit about ischemia and how do we go into different zones. So let's start out with the simple zone, this white zone, which is a zone of ischemia. Remember we said not enough oxygen is going on. So that's when you start to get something really simple like a flipped T wave. When you get into an area of injury, that's when you start to see your classic ST elevations, uh, or depending on what part of the heart it is, ST depressions, like a posterior MI. And then when you get to infarct, meaning tissue has died, that's when you start to get your Q waves going on. Again, this isn't a lesson in EKG reading, that's another lesson for another day. So keep in mind that acute coronary syndrome then is a continuum initiated by a quick turnover and we're gonna come and we're gonna beat this poor guy to death, unfortunately, this atheromatous plaque. We're gonna come back and talk to about him time in and time again during this lecture. There's a lipid rich plaque in the epicardial artery ones that supply the heart itself, and you'll get a platelet activating adhesion that will begin fibrin clot formation in the beginning of coronary thrombosis. Coronary thrombosis from clot in one of these plaques is what causes an MI. So almost a million patients a year will undergo some type of percutaneous coronary angiography every year, meaning the cath they go to the cath lab to see whether or not they are truly having a heart attack. That's the gold standard. EKGs are accurate, histories are accurate, blood work is accurate, but the gold standard is getting that person into the cath lab, just like I showed you in the third or fourth slide when I showed you the STEMI. Acute coronary syndrome, or ACS, is the leading cause of death globally. The spectrum of ACS ranges from unstable angina to non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction and ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Ultimately, ACS is the result of an obstruction of the coronary arteries induced by an atherosclerotic plaque. ACS events are triggered by the plaque rupturing. This exposes subendothelial matrix proteins and other molecules. Platelets are recruited to the site, adhere to the injury, and, together with red blood cells and fibrin, begin to form an arterial platelet-rich clot. This narrows and eventually obstructs the coronary artery. The extent and the location of the blockage and the resulting myocardial damage determine the extent and the severity of the myocardial infarction. Life-threatening arterial clots are formed through two pathways activation of platelets, and generation of thrombin by coagulation factors. Targeting both pathways has been shown to be a viable therapeutic approach. Okay, that's brought to you by the people who make bear, bear aspirin, right? 
Okay. All right, so we're going to go over that uh, cascade effect again very quickly. Here is what happens. You have a lipid core like we just saw. That's the atheromatous plaque. And for some reason, either through time, blood pressure, exertion in the heart, that lipid core is exposed and the red blood cells and platelets see that it's exposed. It begins a coagulation profile where collagen, all these factors begin to adhere and then a clot is activated. So for example, example uh, thrombin and here's one TXA. TXA, if you'll recall, we talked about TXA in the past where we use TXA if we have somebody who's a trauma victim. So in acute coronary syndrome, TXA is our enemy. In acute coronary syndrome, platelets are our enemy. In trauma, TXA is our friend. Platelets are our friend because we want to form clot. So sometimes we hate platelets, like in acute coronary syndrome. Other times we love, love platelets when we're talking about trauma. And then what happens is aggregation, where you begin these nets of fibrinogen, and before you know it, you've got a clot. So we'll beat that horse a little bit more here. And then all these other things are derived and released. We don't really need to talk about these, but I want you to know that they are here. I want you to pay attention to this one here, nitric oxide, because we will come back to nitric oxide um, when we talk about some of our protocols for chest pain. So acute coronary syndrome, essentially we approach it in different ways. Physical exam, EKG, and if we need to, send somebody to re-perfusion. So somebody has signs and symptoms consistent with unstable angina, and we find out very quickly if they have ST elevation or no ST elevation. On the left is no ST elevation. On the right is ST elevation. And then we had kind of crisscross and figure out where are they gonna go. In the field, if you have chest pain, ST elevation, they go right away to the cath lab, to the nearest uh, hospital that has a cardiac catheterization. This part, figuring this out, is sometimes blood work and that's what takes a while to do, and that's our main job in the ER. Usually, sometimes six to seven hours, we'll keep a patient. We'll get blood work, we'll get EKGs, we'll get an echocardiogram, and then we'll determine whether or not they have a STEMI by blood work, or, um, or a non-STEMI, I should say, and then, or if we can send them home. So, the spectrum of presentation from silent ischemia, which is our atypical people that we talked about, to exercise-induced angina, unstable angina, and eventually acute myocardial infarction. That's the picture we showed you earlier of the heart. So let's go back and talk about uh, what people used to call uh, hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis, they, they still call that. And then if you look at early on from the first decade of life, we can see that we start to form these in a typical American diet. What happened in World War II is they started doing autopsies on young people and they were amazed to find uh, that the soldiers who were dying in World War II, some of them as young as 20 and 25 years old, had the beginning and showing of heart disease. And that's why most of us try and watch our cholesterol. But over time, these plaques can get larger and larger. And here is somebody who's in their fourth decade of life, correct? And they've got a large plaque and the lumen way over here is nice, no chest pain here, but a little exertion here and somebody gets chest pain. 
So <clears throat> if you look at a normal artery, as we talked about, over time, they get some fatty streaks. And then these plaques, which we'll talk about uh, again, you've got a stable plaque and unstable plaque, and I'll go over those in just a few minutes. All right, <clears throat> so what are stable coronary plaques? These stable plaques are ones that are not very susceptible to somebody having an MI. They have a thick cap and they are not likely to rupture. Uh, they have less lipid mass inside the artery and they can often produce a narrowed coronary lumen. So you can have angina because you're not getting enough oxygen. Take a nitroglycerin, it expands the vessel and your symptoms go away. And, uh, or you could have a very thin, unstable plaque, which I'll show you in just a minute. So here's a stable coronary plaque. You've got a narrow lumen, you've got a thick fibrous cap, and then you've got your lipid core. The distance between here and here is pretty large, here and here. And this is a, an actual autopsy picture of somebody who has a thick, stable plaque. Here's the artery, which is narrowed, and here is the buildup of cholesterol inside that vessel. But if you look at the distance between the plaque and the opening of the vessel, you can see it's fairly large and it's thick. Unstable coronary plaques have much thinner caps and these are quite susceptible to rupture and they have a greater amount of the lipid or cholesterol inside them. And they often don't produce significant coronary narrowing. So here is a, an example of one. Here's a relatively normal lumen, and lumen is the amount of blood that has to go through there. And then here's a large lipid core underneath, but look how thin this fibrous cap is. And that's the importance. These are vulnerable plaques. For example, here's a very thin core, all right, a very thin fibrous cap and there's clots inside. Now these are obviously taken from, uh, where did these pictures come from? These were taken during an autopsy. This is what a pathologist will find when he does uh, cross sections of a heart. All right, so let's go back to that plaque rupture. We've got the thin fibrous cap right here, and for some reason, because it's susceptible, it's exposed to the lumen, and before you know it, when you have the lipid core exposed to the blood, that's when the platelets start to show up. Now, the way I explain this to folks is, it's kind of like you're back in high school, and you tell one of your friends that you're going to have one of your other friends over tonight and you're going to drink some beer. And he tells two friends and they tell two friends. And before you know it, all these platelets decide to show up. And that's what's happening here. That thin fibrous cap is exposed. The platelets begin to adhere. And as they begin to adhere, more and more platelets aggregate until you've got all these platelets around. And then what happens once all these platelets are aggravated? Fibrin starts to show up. Fibrin adheres the clots to each other and makes them like glue. And before you know it, that little vessel is no longer able to produce flow and a heart tissue dies. So platelet formation is like telling one of your friends in high school that you're gonna have one or two people over for some beers and before you know it, 5,000 people are on your front lawn and they're all throwing up. So that's the best way to think of acute coronary syndrome with platelets. All right, where this occurs, how it occurs, depends. If it's way here at the end of a very small insignificant vessel, 
a distal occlusion, only a small area of heart can happen. But if it's in one of the major arteries, like this one, a large part of heart can die. Where is it going to happen? Which artery? That's the gamble. There's also something called spasm, where you get a heart, uh, the heart uh, vessel begins to form some form of an occlusion, which irritates the wall. And before you know it, the vessel of the wall can go into spasm and this lumen gets even smaller. So here is the spectrum again. There's, uh, you can have something like a heart attack, an MI, unstable angina. The same physiology happens in what we call a stroke or peripheral artery disease. People who get symptoms of what we call claudication in the vessels in their legs, and they're all about the same plaque ruptures, platelets adhere, and you get a thrombus formation and you cannot get oxygen past that. If it's in the heart, it's a, it's a MI. If it's in the head, it's a stroke. If it's in the peripheral arteries, it could be an occlusion of the aorta or the vessels of the femoral artery. All of these are subject to that type of physiology. All right, so we're going to talk about interpretation. Interpretation means how do we put all the facts together and decide on a plan? Or I like this one, when they tell you you can have just one glass of wine a day, never ask what size. All right, so we already talked about the role of platelets in thrombus formation. We know that this is our enemy and it can lead to MI, stroke, or some type of vascular death. If it's in a vessel uh, in the heart, in one of the major, here's the right coronary artery. If it's in one of the larger vessels, a large part of that vessel dies. This black here is all dead tissue. And that means that this person, essentially, this picture was taken at autopsy, which means we did not win that fight. Here's a clot in the vessel. All of this heart is dead. This probably patient probably went into a fatal rhythm, uh, V-fib or V-tac, and then did not make it to the hospital. So where do we stand today? And what is the best way to treat acute coronary syndrome? Well, here's a big fancy slide, treatment of acute coronary syndrome. It's very busy, but it, it just goes over some of the basic things. Uh, we treat all of our initial acute coronary syndromes pretty much the same. EKG, oxygen if they need it, we'll come back to that. Uh, pain medication if they need it. And then we determine if it's a STEMI, we get them on antiplatelet therapy, and then we go to uh, two places. If we're far away from the cath lab, we're gonna give them clot breakers, or we're gonna, PCI is percutaneous, angiography, we're going to take them to the cath lab, or if we can't fix it in the cath lab, they're going to see a vascular surgeon and get a coronary artery bypass graft or a cabbage, and then once we save their lives, they're going to have long-term medical treatment. Or they're going to have this unstable end STEMI, and we're still going to put them on antiplatelet therapy, and we're going to determine maybe down here we'll get them to the cath lab later, they might need a cabbage later on. The end run of this is long-term medical management. So acute therapy, oxygen, bed rest, nitroglycerin, beta blockers, you'll see almost all of your uh, patients who have beta block, go on to beta blockers. ACE inhibitors are usually for people who have heart failure on, tar on top of their MI. Antiplatelet therapy can be something as simple as uh, aspirin, or it could be something like Plavix, or it could be some of the newer, more expensive agents like Eliquis. Maintenance therapy, again, you're gonna treat them with antiplatelet therapies, calcium or, or beta blockers, depending on their age and condition. 
almost everybody's going to go on some form of a statin to lower their cholesterol to uh, decrease those bad um, lipids in the arteries. And then some people will go on ACE inhibitors if they have heart failure. So we talked about this in another slide. Here's a normal state with our PQRST and our upward T. And as we go down the ischemia, injury, and infarct pathway, we start to see our typical changes of stemming. Q waves usually happen later on, and that's a late finding. And we talked about that, and I already explained this. That's what's going on. Now, when we look at EKGs, this is our very brief uh, presentation of uh, STEMI from an EKG standpoint. Keep in mind that certain leads go together. Our anterior, inferior, and lateral leads are defined by where the ST elevation is. You might see septal or posterior leads. Again, we're not talking about infarcts and infarct EKG today, but and that's for another time. But you do have this most likely in your cheat book, and you can see that if you've got lateral or high lateral here changes, you might have inferior or reciprocal changes. And these are the regions of your EKG. Keep in mind that people who have uh, ST elevation in their lateral leads may have ST depression in your inferior leads and lateral and inferior regions talk to one another. And that's part of your EKG anatomy, and that's for another time. Very quickly, inferior infarcts to three AVF, lateral infarcts, one in AVL, anterior infarcts, one, two, three, and four, posterior infarcts, the one, two, and three, and they're usually the flip test, which we're not going to talk about today, you can see this ST elevation or ST depression usually is indicative of a posterior infarction. So we talked a little bit about why we do the things we do. And this is the American Heart Association uh, answer to what do you do with uh, acute coronary syndrome? Very, very busy. But I think the best way to go over that is maybe just to talk a little bit about our local protocols. And this is our local protocol. What we did is we took the recommendations from the American Heart Association and our local cardiologists and we kind of put them into paper so that our paramedics can read their protocol and move forward. So treatment universal is easy. Consider oxygen, two to four liters, if their saturation is less than 94%. Now keep in mind, it's been a couple of years since the American Heart Association has said MONA, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin for all comers. We do know that oxygen can be a toxin if there's too much oxygen going on in the face of ischemia that can cause free radicals to form and heart tissue to die. That's a little bit too deep for today's conversation, but just keep in mind that that's why we don't give oxygen to everybody. We're going to monitor the cardiac leads and do a 12 lead EKG. All right, no later than 10 minutes after the initial complaint. So or as soon as you get there. Establish an IV, and you're gonna avoid the right wrist if possible because it's the right wrist and the right groin that the cardiologist might go into to do a cardiac catheterization. You um, transport as soon as possible to the closest appropriate cardiac facility. So what that means for our guys is that they've got chest pain with an EKG that's not indicative of a STEMI, they just bring them to the local ER. Uh, but you can bypass the closest receiving hospital if 
you see signs of ischemia. Consider the following, aspirin, we talked about that as an antiplatelet uh, agent, nitroglycerin. Do not administer nitroglycerin if the patient has had phosphodiesterase inhibitors in the last 48 hours. Remember that slide way back when, where I talked about uh, nitric oxide? Well, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, that's Viagra and Cialis, uh, will increase nitric oxide in the body. Nitric oxide actually is similar to nitroglycerin and it can cause a very profound vasodilation or expanding of the blood vessels. And if you give nitroglycerin on top of Viagra or Cialis, you can actually bottom somebody's blood pressure out. We'll talk about that in a second. Nitroglycerin IV is in our protocol, as is morphine or fentanyl. You have your choice between morphine and fentanyl. And if you have dysrhythmias, you treat them. And this is a little bit of a way to uh, more and more people are using this, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and this little video will show you a cute way to remember that. So that was uh, Jack Nicholson having a heart attack. And it's very hard for me to see Keno Reeves uh, be an ER physician, but that's okay. Uh, he asked all the appropriate questions. And as we saw in that clip, he was taking a lipid lowering agent. He was taking something for cholesterol. Uh, they slipped nitroglycerin under his tongue. He took an aspirin. And of course, uh, he was on a nitro drip and denied that he was taking Viagra, but we knew that he was. Okay, so we're gonna go on to uh, notes and precautions. Uh, caution given nitroglycerin uh, in inferior MI. Uh, this can result in low blood pressure. Avoid benzos because what we learned is um, if you're giving somebody uh, fentanyl, for example, uh, and they get a little anxious, try not to give them a benzodiazepine because they can uh, wind up giving uh, too much and they can get actually uh, decompensation of their heart muscle. If the 12 lead is negative or inconclusive, repeat it every three to five minutes if symptoms persist, and then try and get the 12 lead in the hands of medical control as soon as possible. Now, we do have things that are activation of what we call HEART1. And if you have uh, an MI and it says acute MI, uh, we try and tell you to believe it. And then we tweaked our, our protocols because women 
Remember I talked about them having atypical presentations? Well, they also have slightly different uh, parameters. Women get 1.5 millimeters of ST elevation in V2 or V3, and men get two millimeters of ST elevation or in two contiguous leads, uh, ST elevation uh, is considered uh, an MI. Uh, if you're not sure, you can call the local emergency department. Uh, we have parameters. We have a number for heart one. It's gonna be different depending on your region. And we have certain areas where you're not supposed to activate a STEMI. That is people who have ROSC with or without ST elevation. These people, uh, if they've had a sudden cardiac event and you code them in the field and now they have ROSC, it's kind of a, um, a hard stop call for us. Uh, get them into the ER as soon as possible and then let the a cardiologist determine whether or not they're going to go into the cath lab. If they're greater than 90 years old, uh, if their blood pressure is low because they might be going into heart failure, if they have respiratory failure, if they're having a stroke with ST elevation, because now we don't know which way to go, treat the stroke first or treat the MI first, that's a decision that should be made by the ER physician with a neurologist and a cardiologist. Of course, the people that do not resuscitate don't activate an expensive part one. And then uh, transfers from hospitals or clinics when cardiologists have already been consulted. Sometimes this has already happened. Uh, for us, rapid transport and transmission of the EKG as soon as possible. This already showed you the inferior leads and the septal leads. This is the little cheat sheet that is already in there. We tell everybody to document their APCs and the GCS and try and just do the basics. Uh, so primary goals for acute coronary syndrome is a reduction of necrosis or death of the tissue. Uh, we don't want, we want to avoid death in all patients. Uh, we want to make sure that people might be having an MI. Let's determine whether or not they're having one because sometimes it's not always evident. And we want to figure out if they need to go to the cath lab, how quickly. And of course, if they go into fatal rhythms, rapid defibrillation. Uh, out of hospital management, we talked about that already. You guys are able to read EKGs in the field, and I think most uh, agencies will have you do this. We trust you, and as I said, you're about 96% accurate. And then sometimes uh, we have a couple of uh, parameters where there's ST elevation with a new left bundle branch block, uh, and these are gonna be built into your local protocols. Sometimes there's a non-diagnostic EKG or a normal EKG, and we try and say, remember, every chest pain is serious. A little bit about why we give certain medications, like morphine. Uh, morphine uh, will reduce the oxygen demand of the heart. Uh, it's also a venodilator, just like nitroglycerin, and it'll decrease preload, just like nitroglycerin. Fentanyl does the same. Um, it will sometimes decrease the heart rate like a beta blocker. If you take away pain, you take away anxiety. And uh, morphine and fentanyl have all the same uh, parameters. And it is a mild dilator of certain vessels, and therefore it will decrease the afterload of the heart. Uh, keep in mind that the cardiac cycle, which we have not talked about a lot today, but uh, you've got your bundle branches and new changes can happen and you can go into fatal dysrhythmia, so keep that in mind. And of course, uh, when we talk about defibrillation, the majority of time, the best way to treat a fatal rhythm is with electricity, which brings me to this slide. <clears throat> 
Las Vegas has got the highest percentage of people who make it through fatal arrhythmias because there's a defibrillator about every 30 feet in Las Vegas. Beta blockers are used uh, sometimes in your acute protocols, but they work to decrease the load of the heart. They will also decrease entropy, so you're most uh, less likely to get VTAC. Um, they will also decrease the size of the infarct if you slow the heart down and decrease the demand of the heart. And sometimes it'll lead to uh, a significant decrease in death after a heart attack. Remember we said a significant amount of people who have had heart disease and an MI can and will go on to have another cardiac event. Contraindications to beta blockers, severe heart failure, severe bradycardia. You don't want to slow a heart down that's already slow. Uh, low blood pressure and signs of peripheral perfusion or second and third degree heart block. Clot formation uh, begins the MI. We already showed this picture and this picture. So clot is our enemy. And we're going to give aspirin. These are all the types of things that work on the platelet. Aspirin is the most common. Dipyrimidol and clopid, these are the ones that doctors may give. Very often people are on low molecular weight heparin or other protein inhibitors like uh, Xeralto. And we got to watch where that thing land because we'll probably need it. Uh, we talked about the platelets and nitroglycerin. Lastly is a vasodilator. We give that because it increases the vessels. Keep in mind that if you've got a narrow vessel with a clot in it or the formation of a clot, when you give nitroglycerin, that vessel gets larger and it will actually work on the smooth muscle. And it causes smooth muscle relaxation, increases the diameter of the artery, which will decrease the pressure on the left ventricle. This leads to a decrease in cardiac afterload by also affecting the afterload Cardiac preload will be affected, and it will also work on angiospasm, which we also talked about in acute coronary syndrome. Thrombolytics, very quickly, there are some agencies, uh, especially in Europe, where TPA is actually given by paramedics in the field. If you're greater than 60 minutes away from a catheterization lab, the recommendation is you give TPA and some agencies do have it in their protocol that if you've got a STEMI and you're 60 minutes away, you can give TPA. Indications, uh, it's usually for thrombolytics, usually a door to drug in 60 minutes and indications are anything that leads to a STEMI. All right, we're almost done. Uh, last slide is, here's a question of, uh, this is a hazmat drill, and uh, this is why women live longer than men, right? Here's this poor schmo over here, and that's the end. All right, questions? Yes, sir, I have a question. Yes. Um, when you talked about the, the cap, the plaque cap, what are some factors that determine the thickness of that? Oh, well, all right, that's a good question. Part of it is genetic. Part of it is uh, where you could keep in mind that you can have a thin cap and a thin cap, a thin cap and a thick cap in the same vessel. And uh, it's hard to say, let me see if I could show a picture. Um, let's go to, Oh, let's see, maybe this picture, hold on. Hold on, let's go to this picture, okay? So a thin cap here could happen at one portion of the vessel, um, and you might have a thicker cap further down that vessel. 
It could be how much lipid is in there, what type of lipid is in there, or it could be a genetic factor that leads to formation of uh, stable coronary plaques, people who will have angina but don't wind up having acute coronary syndrome because this plaque is not exposed to this lumen. So it's multiple factors and there's really not a good way to predict it. Okay, thank you. Jeff, how about you? Pipe up and have you got a question or a comment or are you still here? Uh, yeah, I mean, I did have a question just about, uh, I think in the, your first example, she had uh, quite a serious occlusion and you said she had a normal EKG, but that's, that's just an example of how quickly things develop, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So here's a gal who had a normal EKG, right? And the paramedic was saying, you know, I got to go fight this fire. Why am I transporting somebody with a normal EKG and a normal vital signs to the hospital? What I didn't tell you is the doctor in the clinic had a troponin machine and he found an elevated troponin. And he knew that the lady was, let's go over a history. She had high blood pressure. She smoked, she had diabetes, and she was female. All of these are risk factors for atypical chest pain. And by the time she got to the hospital, she had a significant uh, event. So it, one of the things about having STEMIs in the field or EKG in the field and being able to direct them although they are 97% effective is there's also some complacency with paramedics is, well, this isn't a STEMI, why am I rushing? And sometimes uh, it's spider sense from the physician. And uh, I have had, I've called cardiologists and I said, I have a lady I want to go to the cath lab and they say, what's her troponin? And I'll say it's normal what's her EKG? And I'll say it's normal. And I'll say, if she's not having an acute MI, I'll eat my hat. And very often they'll call me back and go, you know what? You were right. She was having a STEMI. She just looked like she was having a STEMI then, right? As a paramedic, you may not be able to uh, pull that off. I've also told cardiologists, take this lady to the cath lab, she's having a STEMI, and they call me back and say her arteries were clean. So I've had it both ways. I'm not perfect. Okay, thanks for that. Just throwing something out there. Um, a few years back, my uh, father was brought in by ambulance, and he had all the classic symptoms, but his EKG was perfectly normal. Um, they did, did a troponin, the troponin was positive. So they went ahead and, and gave him TPA right there in the ER, and they said the only time that he ever looked like he was having a heart attack at all was when the TPA started working and he started to uh, reperfuse. He had a couple of runs of VTAC. He sat up in the bed, got pale, cool, diaphoretic, threw up, leaned back, said, I feel much better now. EKG stayed perfectly normal, no ST changes, nothing. They took him to the cath lab. He had a 98% occlusion of the LAD and like an 85% in the left circumflex. So sometimes they can just sneak up on even the best docs. Yep, absolutely. Jamie, uh, now that you're no longer incognito, do you have any questions for Dr. Eschelbach about tonight's lecture? Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> um, no, it was really good. You mentioned a few times that, you know, about EKGs and reading EKGs, and that was a topic for a different time. So are you going to be doing that anytime soon? Uh, sure. I'll have to look at that. I'll have to look at our thing. Jane, uh, you can let me know. I think the last time I did it was, uh, I think I did it in May, I think, but I can look back and see. Hang on a second. I'll get you a date, but that might be a good one. Hang on. Yeah. And it's probably on YouTube. There's a lot. Okay, yeah. I know there's a lot. I just did the EKG test thing through Percom, but I still feel like there's a lot I need to know. Yeah. Uh, there, you should be able to look back in my archive and find it if you want, if you're really curious. 
Okay. Um, I know it's back there. Yeah, if if it was one I was able to capture, which I think it is, there should be one on there, uh, Randy. And you can also um, ask or uh, shoot a text message or an email to uh, Gabe Helms and ask him and, and some of the chat rooms if he would do some fine tuning and finer points of, of 12 lead EKG recognition as well, even in chats. He's really yeah, he good has, at doing things really on well. demand in there too that are very helpful. But look back in the uh, round table the MD Roundtable blog, there's a whole bunch of them in there. And I think Dr. Eschelbach has at least one in there where he went through a whole bunch of uh, 12 lead stuff in there that's really very good. Okay, thank you. Stephen Dowd, you're still here. Uh, you got any questions? Yes, I do. Um, as let's say you're a receiving physician and I'm doing an interfacility transfer, would you find it um, appropriate or appreciative if I were to do more 12 leads in route uh, apart from the one at the sending facility that says the patient's already having uh, a STEMI? Oh, that, that's a good question. Um, so would I be, I guess once the STEMI is declared, what I want to see is, is my therapy making a difference? I have had ST elevations that look like this. And I've started nitrates. I have started heparin, because I think they're going to the cath lab. Um, what, you guys won't have heparin in your protocols, but we give boluses of heparin. And you, let's say, uh, starting nitro and starting heparin, and maybe even giving a thrombolytic if they're greater than an hour out. And I've had this lesion go to this lesion, and I've had EKGs normalize. And that has happened as well. So usually uh, an EKG in route would let me know whether or not uh, I could be making um, a difference. The other thing though is you got to watch out for those fatal arrhythmias and that's why you know maybe not a 12 lead but you're going to have your standard uh, uh, two or four lead going on to make sure that you're not dealing with this. This can happen on the way. I've had that happen uh, in front of me. I've had that happen in my waiting room. People who came in, in fact, uh, classic uh, patient in my waiting room. I was on the phone talking to one of my hospital medicine physicians, admitting a patient. And they said, I got to go. Somebody just dropped in the ER. And it was a lady who came in for back pain. And she was sitting in the waiting room for back pain. And she went into a fatal rhythm. And we were able to resuscitate her and send her to the cath lab. And she had a complete occlusion of her uh, right coronary artery. Very thank you. Good I was, thank you. I was just asking because I work in air medical, so it's difficult for me to. I, I mean, I have the patient on my four lead, but it's difficult for me once the patient's in the helicopter to right. attach the twelve lead. So, it's is it worth it for me to spend a couple extra minutes at bedside at the sending facility to get an additional twelve lead or get it set up? Uh, than it is to just get them in the helicopter and start flying after a STEMI has been diagnosed? I'd say after a STEMI, watch for fatal rhythms, get them in the helicopter, and get them to the cath lab as soon as possible. Historically, it would be nice to know. But I'd say in your particular situation, time is muscle. All right, thank you. All right, Umang, sorry, you must have had your uh, time off. You were way, way late. Um, so um, just check, make sure these are 8 p.m. Texas time. I think Dr. Dr. Eschelbach is going to be back on the 28th, which is two weeks from tonight. And do you know what your topic's going to be yet, Dr. Eschelbach? Uh, I think you asked me to do pediatrics, I believe. I did. All right, sounds good. And Dr. Frame will also be doing part two of pharmacology on uh, Friday, November 1st.
So that's all for tonight, folks. Thank you, Dr. Eschelbach, and we'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks. All right. Good night. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night.